Good afternoon. Uh, welcome, Hale Svandiari, the directors of the director of the Middle East program, and welcome to today's uh, meeting. It's a great uh, pleasure to have back at the center uh, Kai Bird, a former fellow uh, who was here um, in, from 2001 to 2002. Um, is going to discuss his book, Crossing the Mandelbaum Gate, Coming of Age Between the Arabs and the Israelis. Mm, he is a Pulitzer Prize winning author and columnist, best known for his biographies of political figure. He is the son of a diplomat, and as a result, he spent his um, childhood in Jerusalem, Beirut, Dahran, Cairo, and Bombay. And he's currently living in Kathmandu, uh, Nepal. Uh, his biographical work include The Color of Truth, MacGeorge Bundy and William Bundy, Brothers in Arms, the Chairman, John J. McLoy, and the Making of American Establishment, and Hiroshima's Shadow, writing on the denial of history and also the Smithsonian controversy. His new book is really a must read. You start reading it, and you just want to go through it and through it and through it. <laughs> and to I confess that I, my understanding was that you still live in Israel. I didn't know that. Then I saw your biography, and I saw that you have been not living in Kathmandu. But the way you describe what is happening now currently in Israel and um, between the Palestinian and the Israelis, I thought you, as you said in your NPR interview, you get up every morning and you see what's going on and there are the demonstrations and so on. So welcome to the Wilson Center and we are looking forward to uh, your presentation. Thank you, Hala. Yes, no, I live in Kathmandu, not Israel. But um, so it was very strange in a surreal sense. I was living in this very exotic Asian city writing about Jerusalem. <laughs> um, Yes, I am the son of a foreign service officer who is sitting right here, <laughs> Eugene Berg. <laughs> so he's ultimately responsible for this book. Uh, because at the age of four, he took me off to the Middle East from Oregon, um, where I was born. And um, we lived in Jerusalem, and then Beirut, and then Saudi Arabia, and then Cairo. And uh, I went back to university in, for one year in Beirut at the American University of Beirut. And <clears throat> then I went back to the Middle East again as a young reporter in my 20s. And <clears throat> the book is called Crossing Mandelbaum Gate because when we, I was a little boy in Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem was then a very much a divided city. Uh, we lived on the, in the Arab neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem. And uh, because my father had a black diplomatic passport, uh, I, was, I had the privilege, the rare privilege, of being able to cross through Mandelbaum Gate, the one checkpoint between East and West Jerusalem. Uh, so we lived in, in the Jordanian sector as such in, in, in East Jerusalem, but I went to school in West Jerusalem. Um, and so I went through Mandelbaum Gate uh, nearly every day. And uh, that gave me, in a literal sense, that I could see both sides. Um, it, it's a very bleak, uh, if you hold up the picture, the cover of the book, there's a picture of Mandelbaum Gate on the co cover there, and it's a very, it was a very bleak geographic point in the city and, and a sore point. It was, uh, there were tank barriers all around and barbed wire and two checkpoints, first the Jordanian and then the Israeli checkpoint. They, you know, men with guns. Um, uh, and 
Again, the title of the book is also the theme of the book because as a young man, I also sort of me metaphorically crossed Mandelbaum Gate again when I, uh, despite the fact having I, growing up in the Middle East among the Arabs, sympathetic to the Palestinian cause, I uh, met and fell in love with uh, Susan, my wife, who is not only Jewish, but is the daughter of, the only daughter of two Holocaust survivors. Um, so the book um, also tells my wife's story, um, and it's, I think, necessary to understand uh, the Middle East conflict uh, through the Shoah, through the Holocaust. You can't understand why this conflict has gone on for 60 years unless you understand the, the sort of psychological scars of the, of the Shoah. And so I, I appropriate my wife's story to, to, to illustrate this theme. Um, coming back to East Jerusalem, our neighborhood, when my father took me there was, we moved into a rented house, a stone, Jerusalem stone house in Sheikh Jarrah, which today has become actually the fulcrum of the whole controversy, the whole conflict. Every Friday, every week now, hundreds of Israelis and Palestinians are meeting in Sheikh Jarrah and demonstrating against the building of settlements in East Jerusalem, and specifically in the Sheikh Jarrah area. Um, and you know, if they're, 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 they're continuing to build, they're continuing to take control of old buildings. Um, ironically, some, some Israelis have come back to Sheikh Jarrah with deeds in their hands of homes that, that they, uh, of deeds that date back prior to Israeli independence, prior to 1948. And they say, we are the proper owners of the, these buildings. And so Israeli courts have said, in some instances, have said you can take over. And <clears throat> this, of course, opens up a Pandora's box in the view of many observers, because if an Israeli with a pre-1948 deed can come back and seize control of an, their old house in East Jerusalem, why can't a Palestinian in East Jerusalem, who and they all have their own deeds and the keys often to their homes, uh, go back to West Jerusalem? And indeed, many of the residents of Sheikh Jarrah are refugees from a, a, a neighborhood in West Jerusalem called Talbiya. And they have the deeds to these homes, these beautiful old Arab homes in Talbiya. Um, so this opens up a real Pandora's box um, in the conflict. And, you know, it, Sheikh Jarrah, therefore, I argue, symbolizes today the intractability of the conflict and the danger that the, the window for a two-state solution is, is rapidly closing. If they continue to build the settlements, East Jerusalem will no longer physically rationally be able to be the capital of a Palestinian state, and that's going to create an enormous political um, obstacle to any kind of peace settlement. Um, Sheikh Jarrah in those years, I'm just going to tell a few stories, of, was uh, you know, a very small town. It, there were maybe 60, 70,000 people in East Jerusalem, and um, one of the first per persons my father met in, in 1956, when we, we went there, uh, was Katie Antonius, who was a neighbor and sort of the grand dame, a sort of dragon lady social figure in, in East Jerusalem who held salons and, and uh, was quite witty and, and had a sharp tongue. And um, she was the widow of George Antonius, the famous Arab historian who wrote the, the book, The Arab Awakening which was the first sort of book in English that um, explained the Arab cause, the, the, the history of Arab nationalism in the 20th century, and um, also the, gave, a, gave the sort of Palestinian case. Um, you know, one of my child, uh, another irony of those years was that um, my best friend at the time, my childhood playmate, was a young boy who, uh, whose father was a Muslim Palestinian. And his mother was uh, a Jewish, German, Israeli, 
Um, and so therefore he was both. Um, and he had a foot in each community. Um, and I tell his story in the book and what happened to him. Uh, he's still living in Jerusalem, but he considers himself to be secular and uh, a Palestinian. And though he lives in, in, in East Jerusalem, he could avail himself of Israeli citizenship. In fact, he was even educated at Hebrew University. Uh, he considers himself Palestinian and refuses to take Israeli citizenship. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated territory. And uh, the book is very much about these difficult identity questions. Um, you know, at one point, I, one of my earliest childhood memories is of going through Mandelbaum Gate and uh, we had just passed the first checkpoint, the Jordanian checkpoint, and suddenly I screamed out to my father, stop the car, stop. And he looked around at me puzzled and, and, and there I was trying to grab off a button that I had gotten from one of my playmates, Palestinian playmates, and it was in my memory, my father has a different memory, uh, <laughs> it was a button showing uh, uh, with an image of Gamal Abdel Nasser, the great Arab nationalist and president of, of Egypt. And uh, I, in my you know, childlike naivete thought that the Israeli soldiers with their guns seeing me with an, a, a button of Nasser, uh, that that would make me, you know, an enemy, a target. Uh, you know, I was very keenly aware at a very young age of the conflict and of the borders and the lines. I had a fascination with maps. Um, I, I could... Uh, I could identify where we were, where Beirut was in Jerusalem and Cairo, and I even knew where China was because my father named me after a Chinese friend of his named Shu Kaiyu. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I also, another sort of early story that, um, I don't actually remember this, but I, I did a few interviews of all family friends, and, and one friend told me this story about my, uh, we one, one day went to uh, the American colony, which was literally a, um, well, today it's like a boutique hotel and watering hole for diplomats and journalists in Jerusalem. Um, it was founded 100 years ago or so by a, a sort of evangelical uh, American missionaries who settled in, in Jerusalem. Um, and it was a very, you know, classy place, even in 1956. Um, and at one point we were we lived there when we first arrived for a couple of months and one evening we went to dinner and there was a an American heiress who had come to visit the Holy Land and uh, she'd spent several weeks in in the city and traveled around and and she got up that evening and apparently gave a toast and and announced that she would give a million dollars to anyone who could solve this Arab-Israeli conflict. <laughs> and, and I apparently tugged my daddy's sleeve and said, Daddy, Daddy, we have to win this contest. <laughs> um, well, no one has taken the, 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 taken the, the prize money yet. Um, it still, still goes on. Um, the, the book is also not only about the Arab-Israeli conflict or Israel-Palestine. Um, we were stationed in Saudi Arabia for th three years. My father and mother actually had three postings there. Um, and I, one of the reasons I wanted to write this book, I just, um, I, I felt, well, I should say, I've been thinking about this book for 20 years. Um, in, in the midst of the 1991 first Persian Gulf War, um, I, I, I've, I felt a rush of sort of early childhood memories. That war just sort of reminded me again of, oh my God, this conflict. Um, and, you know, as a young man, I, as a journalist, I'd gone back a little bit. I'd written a little bit about the Middle East, but I, I realized in the 70s it was intractable and uh, difficult and a black hole psychologically and emotionally and I just decided I didn't want to spend my life on this issue. So I avoided it. Uh, you know, it, it was an abdication really um, of my knowledge and experience and um, so I went on to, you know, but my, but in 91 I began to remember things, and I sat down and I wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post 
um, that they agreed to publish. And it, it talked about my, my fr childhood friend who was half Jewish, half Muslim. Um, it talked about Katie Antonius, and it told the story of my, my wife's Holocaust survivor, survivor parents. Um, and my wife liked that op-ed so much, Susan turned to me and she says, that's the best thing you've ever written. You should be writing a memoir about the Middle East. And of course, I ignored her advice for <clears throat> almost 20 years <laughs> and wrote these biographies of Bundy and McCloy and Robert Oppenheimer. But I've been, I'd, I'd been thinking about it, and I wanted to try to figure out, not, to do not just a childhood memoir, but to try to do a book that would blend the memoir with some really serious history. And I was curious. I, you know, I'd spent my childhood in these places, and, and I had memories, but I really you know, didn't know what was going on around me, um, historically, as an historian. And so in Saudi Arabia, for instance, I describe in two long chapters what life was like there. We lived in a compound in the, for the consulate surrounded by, it was in the middle of the de desert. And two miles down the road was the Aramco American camp. And the American camp was a one square mile surrounded by a tall fence with one gate. And inside, it looked like a Houston suburb with green lawns and <laughs> suburban homes. And, um, and all, each Aramco home had a, you know, there was no alcohol in Arabia then or today. But each uh, Ramcon in, in the American camp had a, his own still. <laughs> and uh, they, call, they brewed what they called Siddiqui. Siddiqui in Arabic is my friend. <laughs> um, and it was a very bizarre, sort of surreal place to live. But <clears throat> as an historian, as I researched what was going on around me, um, I suddenly realized that in the, those years, in 1962 to 64, what was happening in Saudi Arabia was a slow coup d'etat, where the crown prince Faisal was pushing aside his elder brother, King Saud. And what was surprising to me about this, this coup, this slow motion coup, was that in fact King Saud briefly allied himself with some reformers in the royal family, um, red princes, uh, who had been educated back in America and had come back with notions of democracy and um, had uh, announced that they were in favor of uh, uh, having elections with an assembly and turning the monarchy into a constitutional monarchy. Um, and. Then, as I did more research, partly in the archives, I discovered that, well, um, one of our good friends uh, was the government relations expert for Aramco, former OSS, former CIA. And uh, uh, the US government's position on this power struggle was Aramco's position. And Aramco feared that a constitutional monarchy and democracy and uh, these red princes would jeopardize the oil concession and therefore they were against it and therefore the American government was against it. So ironically, uh, at the time that I was living in, in Arabia, uh, there was a window of opportunity for, I would argue, my father has a slightly different perspective I think. <laughs> I think there was a window for Arabia to modernize itself uh, more rapidly and not only uh, economically as it has continued to do so, but politically as well. But the window shut on that. The Red Princes were exiled. Faisal turned out to be a modernizer in terms of uh, commercial and economic and industrial um, things, but he was extremely politically conservative, religiously and politically. Um, uh, <clears throat> I should move along much more quickly. That's fine. <laughs> uh, the book, you know, tries actually to capture the entire American experience uh, uh, of the last 50 years or so. Um, at one point, 
I find myself, I relate that I'm, I'm in Beirut in, 19, in September 1970. I'm trying to study Arabic at the American University of Beirut. And uh, one day I'm sitting <clears throat> in this village called Shemlan, overlooking mm -hmm. Beirut International Airport, uh, studying Arabic. And uh, a friend turns on the BBC shortwave radio. And we hear that uh, four airplanes have been hijacked all in the same day in the skies over the Middle East. And three days later, a fifth airplane is hijacked. And that day, we see it on the tarmac on, down below uh, Shemlan. I can actually see the airport. And uh, this plane, you know, we know has been hijacked. And it takes off after be being allowed to refuel. And so several hours later, I receive a phone call from the American Embassy informing me that my uh, high school sweetheart uh, at the time uh, was on that plane. And so she and 300 plus hostages were held um, in, uh, they landed the planes on an abandoned desert airfield in northern Jordan. And uh, they were held hostage for four days. And at the end of the fourth day, they rushed all the, these are Palestinian guerrillas from the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. They rushed all the hostages off and then blew up very dramatically the three planes. Um, two weeks later, I was sitting in Uncle Sam's restaurant in, in Beirut, having a hamburger near the university campus. And I was introduced at, in, at, at, to the next, at the next table to a, young man who announced that he was, in fact, a member of the PFLP and had been in the, the airport tower that day and was directing the whole <laughs> operation. So we had this bizarre conversation about, well, would you really have killed any of these people? My girlfriend was there. I mean, how could you have taken these innocents? And uh, I, you know, it was a kinder and gentler Middle East. He assured me that no one was ever going to be killed, that, you know, there was a long tradition of hostage taking among the Arab tribes. <laughs> they might have kept them a little longer and marched them off into the desert, but that would have been the worst. Um, but then again, I used the story to tell what happened. The consequence of the hijackings, the September, black September hijackings, was the civil war in Jordan, which, um, uh, in which the Palestinians rose up against King Hussein's regime. They, the Palestinians then, as now, constituted a majority uh, of the population. Um, and the PLO at the time had sort of be constituted itself as a state within a state. Um, and again, looking at it as an historian, I uh, realized after t digging into the story that if it had not been for Henry Kissinger and the American policy at the time of supporting King Hussein um, and Israel's decision to support the, the Hashemite regime, uh, the Palestinians, the PLO, would have taken over Jordan. And Arafat would have become a head of state. Uh, Jordan would have become the Palestinian state. Uh, to my mind, this is like probably the best opportunity there, had, there, there has ever been for a two-state solution. But American policymakers looked at this conflict in the eyes, in sort of Cold War eyes, and they regarded King Hussein as their good friend and plucky little king, and uh, another missed opportunity, I would argue. Um, I, I, you know. Uh, as I said, I, I, in the tail end of the book, I also tell this very dramatic survival story of my parent, of my in-laws, um, who, very briefly, my, my mother-in-law, who is still alive and is now living in Bethesda, uh, her own daughter didn't know this full story until she read the manuscript of this book, but. My mother-in-law, Helma, was orphaned at the age of 16. Her father was uh, imprisoned and, and killed in a concentration camp in Yugoslavia. She makes her way by herself to Italy. And eventually, uh, at the age of 17, in Rome, uh, is given a new identity and becomes a spy for the Italian resistance and is given uh, orders to 
go to the army, German army headquarters in Rome and ask for a job as a secretary. And she does this, she passes muster, and she works for the Germans for 10 months on the side stealing blank identity cards, doing very low level spying, but nevertheless very dangerous work. Um, so I tell the, fa the Goldmark family story as a means to sort of understand the psychological trauma of, of the Shoah and how it still resonates in Israel today. And finally, at the end, I <clears throat> talk about how in 1978, when I was a, an assistant editor at The Nation magazine, I got it into my head to persuade my boss at the time, Victor Navasky, to let me go on a reporting trip to the Middle East. This is right after the first Israeli invasion of Lebanon. And Victor had one um, source, contact, in, in Israel. I was planning to visit both Lebanon and Israel. And he told me, you've got to look up this guy. His name is Hillel Cook, and he has a fantastic story. So I did. I met Hillel Cook in uh, Jaffa, just south of Tel Aviv. And I spent a long afternoon with him and got down his sort of life story. And again, I think, you know, I'm a biographer, but, uh, and therefore I believe that through biography you can understand larger, a larger historical story. And Cook's story is very much in this vein. It's an incredible story and a forgotten story. Uh, but he was, uh, as a young man, he joined the Ergun, the right-wing um, Zionist revisionist or, or a paramilitary organization. And he became a close aide to its founder, Zev Jabotinsky. And in 1940, he accompanied uh, Jabotinsky to New York. Jabotinsky died of a heart attack suddenly. Uh, young Hillel Cook, then in his uh, mid-20s, early 20s, um, becomes the Orgun's undercover envoy to America to raise money, for, to buy guns, to smuggle people into Palestine. Um, and then one day in 1942, he's uh, reading the New York Times, and he reads on page 19, a uh, detailed account of the mobile qu killing squads that Germany was using in Eastern Europe. And he suddenly realizes that, you know, Eastern European j Jewry are at great risk, are being, you know, th th this is more than a pogrom. This is uh, becoming what we now know as the Shoah. And he decided that his mission had changed. He called a meeting of his Ergun cell, and they began to publicize the the Holocaust, taking out full-page ads in the New York Times and the Washington Post saying, you know, Jew for sale, $50. Very provocative stuff. And then in small print he would explain that, uh, you know, if the U.S. government had could put its mind to it, it could rescue thousands of Jews on the periphery of the Nazi empire in Romania and Portugal and Spain <coughs> and Bulgaria. Um, Cook succeeded. He, um, it's again forgotten, but he succeeded in the course of one year in embarrassing the Roosevelt administration into creating the War Refugee Board. And the War Refugee Board appropriated millions of dollars, gold bullion, to literally bribe Nazi guards to, to create rat lines to bring people out of uh, Romania and, and out of Spain. Uh, and most historians think that uh, about 200,000 lives were saved by the War Refugee Board. You know, they hired uh, Raoul Wallenberg, for instance, and sent him to, to um, Budapest. Uh, all of this was the responsibility, was as a result of Hillel Cook, whose um, American alias, by the way, was Peter Bergson. Now, <clears throat> <laughs> Go on. You have uh, another 10 I'm minutes. almost done. I want <laughs> time for lots of questions. But uh, the other day, I went down to the Holocaust Museum because I'd read a story in the New York Times about a year ago that there had been a great controversy among historians about uh, in the Holocaust Museum um, and in Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in, in Jerusalem, about whether 
Peter Bergson's name should be even mentioned. It hadn't been. There was no mention in the Holocaust of the, the man who, without any doubt, had rescued more Jews than anyone else, Oscar Schindler or any of the other righteous ones. Uh, Peter Bergson was not in the Holocaust Museum. Well, apparently about a year ago, the Holocaust Museum agreed to put in a mention of him. And literally, I went and saw the plaque, and it's like a phrase. And it doesn't explain what Bergson did. It just it said that he was a critic of uh, some of the official Jewish American organization's tactics in, in how to deal with the Holocaust. But that's it. Yad Vashem still refuses to have any mention of Bergson, Hillel Cook. Um, now, the reason is not for what he actually did during the war, which was controversial and sort of in-your-face um, publicity, propaganda that made a lot of people uncomfortable and uneasy. But the reason he's still so controversial is that he, in 1945, formed what he called the, the Committee for Hebrew Liberation. And he went back to Palestine uh, he got elected to the first constituent assembly, um, and he argued in a <clears throat> he argued uh, in a you know he wasn't a very popular position, but he argued that the new state should be secular, should not be considered Jewish. It should be imbued with with um, Jewish culture, um, but its national identity uh, should be based on the language, Hebrew language, like most nations, and that Israel should become a country like any other nation, and that it should have a constitution that defined who was an Israeli and who was a Jew. And Bergson, after spending five years in America, realized that most Jewish Americans were not coming to Palestine. So the new state was going to be for the refugees from the Shoah and for the indigenous Jewish Palestinians. He considered himself to be a Jewish Palestinian. So as Cook explained this argument to me, his vision of what the state was, was, should have become, at one point he pulled out his Israeli identity card and he says, look here, the Israeli government is the only government in the Middle East that recognizes Arab as a nationality. I have to choose whether I'm an Arab or a Jew on my identity card. <laughs> <laughs> he says, this is crazy. You know, Israel is not for Jews, per se. It's for Hebrew-speaking people of Jewish ancestry who've decided to live in this part of the world. And, you know, then he explained that, you know, part of his objection to the traditional Zionist leadership was that they were, they had created a state and a foreign policy and a national security policy in which Israel was fighting wars on behalf of Jews all over the world. Uh, Golda Meir, at one point in the October 1973 war, um, was up on the Golan Heights, and she was quoted as telling um, some Israeli soldiers that their sacrifices would not be worth it if they were fighting just for the Jews of Israel, but they were fighting on behalf of Jews all around the world. And I find, and Cook found this concept, you know, messianic. And at the heart of the, you know, if you want to ask why 60 years after the founding of Israel we're still living with this, this terrible conflict, it's because of the messianic notions that are now, exist not only in the Israeli side, but now, um, you know, the Palestinians have been defeated com complete again and again, and each time they're defeated, you know, the uh, they become less and less secular. So n this explains, of course, the rise of Hamas. And, um, anyway, I think I've talked too much. Um, there is, <laughs> people ask me, at the, you know, is there any hope? And um, when I finished the first man draft of the manuscript, my editor looked at it and she said, well, can't you end on a little <laughs> hopeful note? <laughs> And uh, so I, I added a, a, a epilogue where I describe um, another old childhood neighbor, Sari Nusebi. 
And my <coughs> father knew Sari's father, uh, Anwar Nusebi, who was foreign minister at one point in the 50s and 60s. Foreign minister? Defense. Defense minister. And uh, Sari Nusebi today is president of Al-Quds University. And uh, he, in 19, what, uh, sorry, 2002, 2003, uh, he and Ami Ayalon, the former head of Shin Bet, um, actually Ayalon initiated this. He wrote a one-page peace agreement, seven points, very simple. And, and I argue that if you look at this document today, and 250,000 Israelis have signed this petition, and uh, slightly fewer Palestinians, it's eminently rational. It's obviously the thing that is going to happen someday. Um, and, you know, it's a two-state solution along the Green Line, with Jerusalem being the capital of both states, East Jerusalem being the capital of Palestine. And, um, and one-to-one -one, uh, exchanges of land where it seems impractical because of the facts on, you know, the new facts on the ground. Um, and, and these people are going to have to live together in, in a, with a two-state solution, and eventually with, I would hope, open borders and, and free trade and all that. Um, so that's my hope. And uh, Sari, like me, is a very naive man. He admits this in his memoirs. <laughs> And I, I, I confess to being naive too, but you know the realists have uh, had their shot at this, and they've failed for decades. And so I, that's my vision. And I, if it's naive, so what? <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. We're now opening the floor to questions. Uh, just wait for the mic, please. It's coming here. Oh, hi. Thank you. I very much enjoyed your talk. Um, and we'll buy your book, of course. Um, did Hillel Cook's vision, you say um, he, he uh, talked about uh, Palestine as a home for uh, secular people of Jewish ancestry speaking Hebrew. Did that vision also include uh, the indigenous Arab population? Well, Cook hoped that Palestine would have a majority of Jews in it. Um, but he thought that it was very important that it be a secular state because it had to be able to give full citizenship to the Arabs who were there. Um, he didn't believe in expelling them or waging, you know, continual warfare against them. And <clears throat> but yeah, he hoped that you know the that the Hebrew Republic. Um, and I should say this is not you know I'm not the only one making this argument these days. But um, Bernard Avishai, the fairly well-known Israeli-American historian, has published a book called The Hebrew Republic. Um, last year, and uh, again, it's, it's this is a minority point of view, decidedly. But uh, there are Israeli uh, columnists who, um, you know, write about sort of the post-Zionist uh, view of their post-Zionist view of the conflict. Um, again, Cook believed that once you establish the state of Israel. Uh, there was no purpose for a Zionist movement as such. It, it had succeeded in its goal. Um, so Zionism as such should have ended, and the new Israeli state should have quickly um, had a constitution. In fact, the first election was for a constituent assembly uh, whose sole mandate was to write a constitution. And there were some legal scholars who did some drafts. But Ben-Gurion, um, on the very first day of the meeting of the Constituent Assembly in January of 1949, he offered a motion to turn the Constituent Assembly into a Knesset. And uh, Hillel Cook was sitting right there, and he stood up and cried out, Putsch! Because he understood that what Ben Gurion was doing was postponing or, or evading all these hard questions of identity, of citizenship. 
and the relationship between the temple and the state. And, um, and he was doing so, Ben-Gurion thought, on sort of, I, I would argue, very narrow political tactics. He had a plurality in the new constituent assembly of the Knesset, um, but not a majority, and so he had to have coalition partners. He hated the communists. He didn't want to ally with the socialists. He <laughs> and so he ended up allying himself with the religious parties. And he opened another Pandora's box by giving them um, uh, control over education and allowing the, the rabbinic courts to determine questions of who is a Jew. Um, and he didn't think that the religious parties were going to be very significant, you know, in the future, and um, alas, he was wrong. But to answer your question, yes, Cook, Cook wanted to think of himself as a Palestinian who could live in peace with his Palestinian Muslim or Christian neighbors, and uh, but he hoped that there would be, you know, that Palestine would be drenched in Jewish culture and language. The language was the key. Yes, uh, Mike is coming, that's right. Yeah. I'd like to, maybe I, you could amplify a little bit on um, the views you have of Nasser um, and whether mm. Nasser was willing, uh, as you seem to suggest, at least at one point in your book, um, to, to make um, a peace uh, and play ball with the West. Uh, certainly there were mis there there are a variety of uh, missed opportunities and a variety of moments, um, or whether, on the other hand, there was sort of a dialectic at play where what might have seemed to be an opportunity, a willingness of Nasser really w would have to come after the events that uh, <coughs> made it impossible for him to do so. Uh, so really, if you could get at just through what you think of Nasser. Um, Nasser was... Even in my childhood memories, I was a teenager living in the period 65 to 67 in Egypt, and even then, Nasser was a highly charismatic figure. You know, my Arabic wasn't anywhere near good enough to understand his speeches, but, but you could watch him on television, and he was captivating. And uh, he was highly popular, and in 1956, he was elected in, in what I think everybody regards as uh, not a fair election, but, but uh, an election that, that fairly represented the will of the Egyptian people. He, he, he won massively and, and um, was genuinely popular. Um, he gradually became, over the years, you know, he turned his, the, the Egyptian state into a sort of bumbling police state. And, uh, corrupt, and, uh, but he was not personally corrupt. Um, and in the book, I argue that he, in fact, if you look at the archives, um, in 1954, soon after he came to power, uh, he was having secret peace talks with his Israeli counterparts. Um, he told numerous uh, third-party diplomats that he was open to the notion of recognizing the new Israeli state, but they had to solve in some way the Palestinian problem, if only by a token amount of, quote, repatriation or, and compensation for those who um, were outside of Israel. Um, and again, repeatedly over the years, there, he, there were moments. Um, I talk about a moment after after the 67 war where uh, John J. McCloy, the man who I wrote my first biography about, um, was sent by Johnson to the Middle East uh, on a secret mission. And he went and he saw King Faisal and King Jordan, uh, King Hussein and, and Nasser. And he got the agreement of Nasser and, and the, these two other monarchs to a essentially a, um, what, what we know now as a land, land for peace deal. And if the Israelis would with, withdraw from the Sinai, Egypt was willing to sign a peace treaty. Um, the whole thing fell apart because McCloy 
it was a secret mission, and uh, he came back and McCloy briefed Johnson, and and Clark Clifford reportedly turned to Johnson and said, "Well, you can't get into this in an election year." <laughs> and with the Vietnam War raging, he was you know he was al already a wounded president, and he just decided not to take on this uh, this albatross. But I argue that yes, he, Nasser was after all a secular man. Um, he was actually very pro-American in, in, in a cultural sense. He loved American Hollywood movies. He read Mark Twain. He, uh, you know, he <clears throat> compared to the people that we're trying to deal with today, he was a, a reasonable uh, partner in any kind of diplomatic negotiation. And his defeat in 1967, and I, this is in the chapter on Egypt I describe in quite detail, uh, sort of the souring of relations between the Americans and the Egyptians. And, you know, the, the Americans in the late 50s and 60s were trying to unseat Nasser. Um, at one point, I quote a, a friend of ours, an American diplomat, who said, well, you know, if, if we'd been able to find someone to, to uh, launch a coup d'etat against him, we would have. Uh, and then they, in the months leading up to the 67 war, the Americans cut the wheat shipments, the PL-480 wheat shipments, and um, and in the end, uh, there is some controversy about this, but I argue that the evidence shows that uh, Israeli intelligence officers went to have a meeting with, with um, McNamara and got the green light and Johnson knew knew this, and they got the green light to go ahead and, and initiate a, a preemptive war against Egypt because they saw a window of opportunity to create new facts and hopefully to unseat Nasser. They didn't succeed in unseating him, but they so you know de uh, they they defeated him in a psychological sense. The man was a broken leader after that, and uh, by defeating secular Arab nationalism, we of course in the end opened the window to Islamic fundamental political Islam, which I think everyone would agree was a disaster. Um, yes, please. <clears throat> um, Kai, could you talk a bit about your family's uh relationship with the Bin Laden family. <laughs> because... Uh, that was it, fascinating. It, 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 and, and I'm not putting any value judgments on that statement. Yeah. Because I think it leads back to what you've, you've just talked about. Um, you know, Osama Bin Laden and, and uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri are the latest uh, sort of leaders of the war with the United States for control of the Middle East. And my question is, if there were Arab democracy along the lines of the Red Princes you're talking about from the, uh, from the 60s, sort of constitutional monarchies and actual elections, would their perspective of the Zawahiri and bin Laden, could it win, for example, majority votes and power in Egypt and Saudi the way the feast did, or almost did, they've been permitted in Algeria in 1991? Mm -hmm. What is the, your, your understanding of that? Well, let, let, let me confess that, um, uh, I, I sort of in the book present myself as this uh, Leonard Zelig like figure, you know, <laughs> Woody Allen's character who just happens to pop up here and there, <laughs> all the wrong moments. <laughs> and um, indeed, in Egypt, we lived in Mahdi, and I didn't know him, but he, I'm in Zawahiri, is my age, and he, we went to the he went to watch movies, Hollywood movies, uh, at the Mahdi Sports Club, where, which I was a member of. I'm sure we bicycled you know, past each other on the streets. You know, he came from a middle-class family. His father was a, a medical doctor, and he became a doctor. Um, and likewise, in Saudi Arabia, uh, my parents <clears throat> became good friends with Salam bin Laden, the eldest brother of Osama. And my mother tells the story in the book of, of how Salem would come over with his guitar and he loved 
uh, Bob Dylan songs, and my mother would whip out her guitar, and they would sing Bob Dylan songs, <laughs> blowing in the wind together. Um, and and at one point, uh, Solomon told my parents that they, he couldn't understand what had happened to his younger brother Osama, why he'd become so religious. Uh, and, you know, the, there was a turning point. You know, the Middle East is a complicated place, but when I was growing up in it, it was uh, young Arab men were into Western music, the Beatles, like everyone else at the time. And they were into modernization and, uh, uh, you know, Western consumer um, things. Beirut was, you know, a fantastic place where you could go and see Hollywood movies, French movies, um, big Egyptian la lang Arabic language production films, um, uh, and you know, national Arab nationalism and a secular Arab nationalism was the vision. Now, when this was defeated in in what they call the Naksa, the setback, you know, it wasn't a setback. It was just a psychological blow to the, the hearts and minds of, of a whole generation of Arabs all over. Uh, you know, initially some in the Palestinian movement, the, the Marxists, the PFLP, you know, in 1970 began these hijackings and uh, a sort of a Marxist revolution was, was uh, supposedly in the offing. But of course that was defeated too. Um, in this, the Civil War in 1970, 71, and they pushed the PLO out to the refugee camps in Beirut <coughs> and elsewhere in Lebanon, which of course pro pro provided one of the catalysm for the 15-year the, the, the civil war in, in Lebanon, which of course created the Shiite um, revivalism and, and what we know today as Hezbollah, who, who now has 40,000 missiles. I mean, it's just, um, but your question was, if they had elections today, who would win? No. If no. they had become a democracy, ah, would these they, people ah, uh, have uh, won? Yeah. Would, would the Islamists won? And given the example of Algeria yeah. and FIS. Yeah. Sure. Well, I would argue that there, yeah, there was a possibility for that. You know, there were, there were and there are today um, progressive Arab moderates who are are committed to norms of democracy and free expression. You know, it doesn't have to be this way. And I I, I cite the the work of um, the Syrian philosopher Sadiq Al Azam, uh, who is a secularist and who has written some very tough books in Arabic that are widely read, um, critical of, you know, trying to explain, one, the 67 defeat, but then also trying to explain the rise of uh, political Islam and being very critical of it. And Sadiq al -Azim today argues that he thinks that the jihadists, you know, that their high point was 9-11. They can't possibly succeed because they don't have a goal that is rational in any sense and in the end you know they will be defeated and become unpopular and I, I argue in the book too I went back with my father to Saudi Arabia in 2007 I could only get in because of him <coughs> uh, and and we spent about two weeks going around Arabia and you know it's astonishing the, the change and I argue, ironically, one of the sort of liberal hopes in the Middle East today are the Saudis. Uh, you know, they, it, it's, it's a very hypocritical society, schizophrenic, but there are hundreds of thousands of well-educated Saudis who've gone through American universities, and I, I met a Saudi woman who was very feisty and outspoken and... Um, was talking about how she thought within five years she'd be able to drive. But then she explained that driving wasn't really, you know, what, what it <laughs> wasn't at the top of her list. She wanted, you know, the right to vote, and, and she thought that this was going to happen someday soon, too. Uh, but so, yes, there is 
I, I have hope that there is a, uh, you know, a, uh, a revival of, of uh, the secular democratic option. Uh, in recent years, every time we have had a meeting here on the Middle East, it has been gloom and doom. So I'm so glad that at <laughs> least in your case, it's not gloom and doom. Mr. Bird Sr., you have the last word, the last question, <laughs> the last comment. <laughs> Uh, Kai, I, I wonder uh, two things. One, uh, why you didn't call it, uh, call it double crossing Mandelbaum Gate, because that's what you did. You went across twice. And, you know, and that's the sweetest <laughs> sense of humor on it. Uh, has the, the wrong connotation. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in English, you're right. Um, I, I wonder if it's going to be in Hebrew mm. and in Arabic. And what do you think will be, I haven't seen any uh, reaction in Israel or Palestine to your book yet. It may be a little early, soon. but uh, mm -hmm. do you have any insight from uh, some of your sources as to what, uh, what, it, uh, uh, what your ideas about a two-state mm -hmm. solution uh, and getting the parties together? Uh, as naive as you are, and I am. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and secondly, what about Obama? Is he the Johnston uh, of, uh, of the Middle East at this point uh, in terms of, uh, can, can he move? Can he really move the way he has to with Mitchell and uh, other people in, in order to get to peace? Uh, well, um, let's see, early reactions. I. Uh, after Christopher Hitchens wrote a long and and really glowing and of course quite intelligent review <laughs> in the Atlantic, um, I sent that to Sari Nasebi and and he emailed me back that you know he was very pleased to see that kind of reception for a book like this. Um, but he he was very pleased to see that. Uh, that a book like this was getting a, a, a warm reception so far. But, uh, and I, I've had a, a little email correspondence with another old friend uh, in Ramallah, who, uh, Rita Jackman, who <coughs> is actually married to uh, Mar uh, Mustafa Barghouti. I was going to say Marwan, but Marwan is in jail, I think, right now. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and Mustafa Barghouti is, is uh, you know, an eminently reasonable Palestinian leader, a medical doctor who um, ran for president. I think he won maybe 20 percent of the vote against Abbas. But he, he is a possible future Palestinian leader and, and um, you know, wants to live in peace with his neighbors, but he wants a Palestinian state and he's in favor of a two-state solution. Sari is, you know, getting very pessimistic. He thinks that time is running out and that the door is closing on uh, the possibility of a two-state solution just because of the facts on the ground. And, of course, you know, both of these men are politically extremely isolated. And I mean, even in the West Bank, they're somewhat marginal politically, and let alone in Gaza. Um, uh, as to Hebrew, uh, I, I am I have a, a Jerusalem literary agent who's trying to hawk the book to get a Hebrew edition. Uh, it hasn't happened yet, but uh, um, several Israeli newspapers have run reviews. Uh, Haaretz ran a long review that was, you know, quite. Um, Quite receptive. It had some criticisms, um, and I've tried to I've tried sending several emails to Egypt, uh, Lebanese publishers looking for an Arabic language edition, but everyone tells me that it's impossible. That very few books are translated into Arabic, and that it's hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> and the Obama. Oh. <laughs> well, I don't. You know, I'm I'm not. I don't write about. <laughs> The current stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I have taken note of the recent, you know, crisis over 
East Jerusalem and the settlements between Obama and, and Netanyahu. And I was surprised Obama sort of dug in his heels and he hasn't compromised and he's still demanding an end to the settlements. And I think that's quite encouraging. Uh, but, you know, if I were to really be honest, I, I guess uh, I, f I find it I would be wiser to be pessimistic about any real breakthroughs. Um, I think it's got to come. It's got to come from Israel and Palestine. It's got to. I have great hope that what's happening in Sheikh Jarrah will escalate and balloon. That and in fact, there were several hundred six months ago demonstrating, and then a few weeks ago they had three to five thousand turnout and some people were arrested but the Israeli courts have said no no these are legal demonstrations they're not violent uh, but the police continue to arrest people um, and if this could balloon if you know we could reignite the Israeli peace movement maybe that would create opportunities but uh, it's really hard you know <laughs> Uh, in the end, you know, uh, <clears throat> you, you can always predict that there'll be a Middle East crisis a year from now. <laughs> <laughs> so much for the optimism. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> uh, please join me in thanking Kyle Burke for